this is one of the questions that can be easily answered by it depends. Um, if we continue business as usual in terms of dealing with climate impact, then certainly we won't. Um, the trends are uh, the impact is heavy on countries that are already struggling uh, environmentally, economically, etc. etc. <clears throat> the one thing that determines whether a state would tip into fragility or not is if it already has weak governance mm -hmm. structures, if there are ethnic fault lines, for example, if there is a legacy of conflict. Previous conflict makes it more likely to have future conflicts. If you add the complexity and another layer of climate impact on populations, on livelihoods, on economies, then we would certainly see more. But this is not a prediction game. We can't say who is going to be and who isn't going to be. Approaches, uh, policies, strategies that we adopt, both sort of international community and <clears throat> to what extent countries will take it on, uh, determines whether a state would tip into that uh, or not. The most important role is to recognize that intervention after disasters could either exacerbate existing problems or it could deal with it and becomes an opportunity. I can give you two very clear examples. So the contrast between the response to the tsunami in Aceh in Indonesia, <clears throat> that's a conflict situation, the contrast between this and the response to exactly the same event in Sri Lanka. Post-disaster relief in Aceh was handled in such a sensitive way and capitalized on as actually an opportunity that it became a kickstart, a conduit to peace talks, conflict resolution, etc., etc., etc. And it, 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 it almost became an opportunity. A disaster turned into an opportunity. How was that done? What it was determined? Every single decision that was made along the way, from the very, very simple approach that the Indonesian government adopted at the beginning of bringing in relief at the army, the Indonesian army, bringing in relief items, but having a very soft approach <clears throat> in military terms. In military terms, a soft approach means open vehicles, no helmets, no shades, no armored, uh, personnel, no armored personnel carriers, no guns, none, none of that at all. So they came in uniforms, but it came in with a very strong message as a helping, a helping hand. And then not just that, but everything that followed from that on and the peace dialogues that ensued. Contrast this with what actually happened in Sri Lanka, how much it, it, it not only exacerbated uh, previous vulnerabilities within the Tamil population on the East Coast, for example, and then you had the final push in 2009 with an all-out assault, and okay, from the Sri Lankan uh, government's point of view, they don't have a problem anymore, but intervention was so different from what happened in Indonesia. So the, the, the short answer to a question like this is post-disaster relief, particularly in fragile situations, could both help and hind or hinder uh, peace talks or peace efforts. It could tip it into even an all-out conflict, or it could be an opportunity that would lead to peace and stability after that. Not very different from the, <clears throat> from the non-fragile states. The biggest challenge is commitment. <clears throat> there is always commitment to emergency relief. Uh, it's what attracts a lot of attention. It attracts media attention and it attracts funding. And unfortunately, interest wanes after that. There is a move for the next big disaster. The, uh, the big difference between fragile and non-fragile contexts is that fragile states require even longer commitment, both uh, politically and more so financially to transition from emergency into long-term uh, development. Uh, in the absence of this commitment, 
there's more likelihood that you would either revert back to a conflict situation if there was a conflict in the first place, or you'd never come out of uh, a fragility situation. Uh, commitment is by far is sort of the umbrella challenge. Uh, the, cha the more specific challenges are the <clears throat> approaches and programs taken up during the emergency phase. In a fragile situation with the possibility of conflict, if you have ethnic fault lines, for example, or divisions within the population, the way emergency relief is handled when you have these divisions, when you have this, it has to be extremely sensitive. And it has to be sensitive and entirely and only based on the needs of the population, not who's in power, not who determines who gets what, etc., etc. And, and these are things that, particularly international NGOs, are extremely aware of.